Welcome back to Kotlin at Lightspeed. In this part, we're going to talk about some Kotlin-specific features that make our life a little bit nicer, which is why I named this part Kotlin Niceties. So we're going to navigate back to the project that we started all the way at the beginning of the series. I called this Kotlin at Lightspeed. If you haven't done so already, I recommend that you check out the first videos of the series. Now, in com rock the JVM, the package I made for this particular mini course, I'm going to create a new Kotlin application. I'm going to call this Niceties. And uh, we're going to see why these niceties are called niceties, because they make our life a little bit cooler. And specifically, I'm going to talk about nullables. I'm going to talk about special methods and uh, operators. And I'm also going to talk about a nice feature in Kotlin called extensions. So these are the three fundamental things that I'm going to talk about in this video. Let's start with nullables. Well, you know about the null reference. It contains no value. Now, let me define a little scenario for the null reference so that we can have something to work with. I'm going to define a data class. I'm going to call this developer. And uh, because this is a data class, we discussed that in one of the earlier videos. So val name as a string. Let's say val favorite language as a string. So for now, we have a simple data class. Now, let me define, let's call this a maybe developer as having the type developer. And in many languages, if you have a variable with a particular reference type, for example, a class, on the right-hand side, you can assign the null reference. Now, this thing is not possible in Kotlin. That is because whenever you define a variable or the compiler expects a value of a definitive type, you cannot assign the null pointer to them. Rather, if you have something that can be null, you'll add a question mark to the type. So this is only possible if the type is what is called nullable. Nullable means that it has a question mark at the end, and the nullable type is the original type developer plus the null reference. This is the nullable type. And all types in Kotlin have nullable versions of them. For example, there is a in question mark, a person question mark, and um, any question mark, and so on and so forth. So nullable types are types with question marks, meaning that you can assign a null pointer to them. Now, the catch is that if you have some sort of fields or uh, properties or methods, you cannot really access those properties or methods unless you make sure that that particular value is not null. So for example, if I say dev name as a maybe developer dot name, this is not possible because maybe developer for all we know could be null and accessing the property of a null reference could crash, which is why nullables have a special protection in the Kotlin language and uh, by the Kotlin compiler that it does not allow you to access properties or methods unless you know that this is not null, which is why the definitive developer type would be, let's say, developer with, let's say, name master Yoda and favorite language is the force. This is possible. So because the type itself knows for a fact that any value associated to this type is not null, then you can safely access properties or methods. But if you have something nullable, then you cannot. So this is a special protection from the Kotlin compiler that it does not allow you to access property uh, properties or methods unless you know that this thing is not null. Now, there are a bunch of checks that you can do in order to access the developer's name if you know for a fact that if it's null. So for example, let me put this in main. So this is not possible, but I could say something like dev name as a string as if maybe developer is equal to null, then I'm going to provide some sort of value like John Doe, else, and on the else branch, the compiler knows that maybe developer is not null, so I can say maybe developer dot name. So at this point, compiler knows that uh, the maybe developer is not null. Now, there is a shorthand version of this sort of check because it's so popular. Let's say dev name version two as maybe developer. And there is a question mark dot. And with question mark dot, you could call uh, properties or methods of this maybe developer instance if it's not no. So I'm going to say question mark dot name. The catch is that this Dave name version two is also a nullable. So whenever you use an operator like question mark dot, the nullable property also transfers to the expression that you obtain. So in this case, dev name version two is a string with a question mark. So this turns a nullable into a nullable, meaning that if the maybe developer is null, then the entire expression is null. If it's not, then the name property is accessed 
And uh, that is going to be the value of div name version two. So this question mark dot is a safe call operator. And this turns a nullable into a nullable by accessing properties or methods as you would on normal instances. Now, if you also want to provide an alternative to a nullable, there is an alternative version to the if check. So I can say, let's say uh, dev name definitive as dev name version two, which is a nullable. And if this thing is null, you can provide an alternative version or an alternative value by saying question mark colon John Doe. So the equivalent way of accessing this developer name if it's null or otherwise John Doe would be to say, let's say true dev name as maybe developer question mark dot name or else John Doe if this thing is null. So with this shorthand syntax, you avoid the very defensive and very verbose if not null checks. Okay. Now this operator, the question mark colon, is so-called the Elvis operator. And I'm guessing because uh, this little sign, if you put a smiley here, this would probably be a little Elvis emoji. So this is the safe call operator and the Elvis operator for the or else, if you want to provide an alternative version to a nullable expression. So that's nullables in a nutshell. Okay, second thing, special methods and operators. Well, Kotlin has some special syntax sugars, that is um, equivalent syntax that is shorter or nicer to write and to read for some methods and operators. For example, let me define a data class. I'm gonna call this person with a val name as a string, val age as an int. Okay, now I'm going to define a method called likes, say movie, as a string. And let's assume that this thing returns an expression like name says, I love movie. So this is a plain little method called likes. Okay. Now if I define, let's say Val Daniel as person with the name Daniel and my age is 99 years old, let's say, and I'm going to have a Daniel statement as Daniel Daniel dot likes and let's say I love the movie Dune, which was absolutely fantastic. Well, you can say Daniel dot likes Dune, or if you put an infix keyword before the definition, you can use the likes method in what is called infix notation. So if you have a method with a single argument, it doesn't matter what type that is, but if you have a single argument, you can use, well, let's call this Daniel statement version two as Daniel space, likes, space, dune, which reads much like the English natural language. So this is syntax sugar for methods with one argument. You can add the infix keyword to be able to use them like natural language. Okay. There are other special methods that you can use. For example, you can add operators. Let me define a little class. I'm going to call this complex number, which has two uh, properties, a var real as double and a var imaginary, which is double. So this is a common representation in mathematics. You can also call this a vector if you want. If you're more into graphics, you can call this x and y. And two vectors can be added by just adding their components, x and y. So I'm going to add a little fun. I'm going to call this plus, which takes an other as a vector. And I'm going to return another one. So I'm going to have a vector with x plus vector with a capital V, x plus other x, and y plus other y. Now, if I prefix the plus function with the keyword operator, then I can use the plus method as an actual mathematical operator. The method must be called plus, it must take another argument, and it must return some sort of result. So for example, if I define a val, let's call this vector one, like a, as vector with 1.0 and 2.0, let's say, and val b as vector with, let's say, uh, 3.5 and 6.7, I can add these two vectors by saying val sum, or a plus b, as a dot plus with the argument b, which is the natural way of calling the plus method, obviously. But I can also have a pb, or a plus b version two, as a, plus 
B, like the mathematical notation. And this is syntax sugar for A plus B. So when you say A plus B, you're actually calling the plus method on the object A with the argument B. So this is very nice because you can overload operators. And this is, uh, or this has the same rules for minus, we have times, which is the multiplication, div for division, and rem for the mod operator, if you're using that for numbers. There are other kinds of operators, and I discussed them at length in the Kotlin Essentials course. I'm going to give you another example. Um, for instance, I'm going to show you how you can access an item. So I'm going to have a fun get at a particular index, which is an int. So the get function can also become an operator if it has a single argument and it returns something. For example, I'm going to get index either zero or one and I'm going to return the component X or Y depending on what the index is. So I'm gonna run a when clause. So when index is zero, I'm going to return the X part, one returns Y and else I'm gonna throw illegal argument exception. So vectors only have two coordinates. Now, when I say operator fun get, obviously I can get the component, let's say ax, which is the component x from the vector a, a dot get on the index zero, which is me calling the get method with the argument zero. So that's the normal notation. Or I can say ax version two as a indexed with zero, which is the same thing. So this allows things like collections to index items. For example, if you watched the collections part, whenever you saw the indexing syntax for a particular for a collection, for example, a list, when you say a list at index two, you're actually calling the get method on the list type. And similarly for maps, so whenever you're using map indexed with a particular key, you're actually calling the get method. Not only that, but the get operator can also take more, more than one argument. And if so, if you want to use the indexing square bracket notation, you'll simply pass the arguments here inside the square brackets. So that was big subject number two with special methods and operators. Third big uh, subject is extensions. Extensions means that in Kotlin, we can add new methods to existing types after they've been defined. And that is outside their definition, their locus of definition. Let me show you an example. So let's assume that we would like to add new method to the int type, which we cannot really modify. It's based on, uh, it's in the Kotlin standard library, but I can define a fund int dot. Let's assume that I want to add new method to repeat a string. So let's say repeat a string, which is string. And this returns a string. And I can actually implement this sort of method. For example, var result as a empty string and for i in one dot dot the this that I'm calling repeat on, so dot dot this, I'm going to say result plus equals string, a string. That's how I called it. And finally, I'm going to return the result. So this is a plain algorithm. It's not the uh, nicest thing ever, but it's it does the job. So what I've just done is I've added a new method called repeat on the int type that takes a string argument. So for example, I can say val well, kotlin times three as three dot repeat on the string kotlin. So notice that I can call this method which did not exist on the int type, and now it does through this sort of structure. Now, you may be asking why are extension methods useful? They're very useful for nicer APIs, and in particular, DSLs. For example, the error functional programming library uses extension methods quite a lot. DSL, by the way, meaning a domain-specific language. So you're kind of shaping the way that your code looks like to almost resemble another programming language through this sort of structure. Now, you can even combine the concepts that we've been discussing in this part to have an operator fun. So operator fun and uh, operator can, also, can only be added to some methods with some specific names. For example, I'm going to call this times. And times means mul multiplication. So I'm going to have an operator times. And I can say val kotlin times three version two. Instead of three dot times on the string kotlin, I can say three multiplied on the string kotlin. And this is the same expression. So with this sort of structure, you can achieve some pretty nice and powerful stuff.
So there I have it, folks, some Kotlin-specific features that will hopefully make our programming lives nicer, safer, and hopefully more fun. So if you like the mini-series so far, go ahead and click the like button for me and subscribe to the Rock the JVM channel for more videos like this. And check out the Kotlin Essentials course where we discuss all the sort of concepts that we've been talking about in this series at much greater depth with lots of exercises and with lots of practice. So see you next time.